where we can worship the Lord. I tell you, it's a little bit unconditional or untraditional. You look back, and when Jesus came, He changed all kinds of traditions, and He made things made things amazing, made things better. So we ain't gonna fret about it. We're gonna worship like this until the 24th, and then we're gonna get back in the church, and we're gonna resume worshiping in there. Last week I talked about depression a little bit, uh, des- uh, depression during desperate times, uh, and, I, and uh, I spoke about a few of the pillars of Scripture that suffered with depression uh, that was in the Bible. And I also talked about how they refused to be identified by their struggles, and this week we're going to talk a little bit more about our identity in Christ and who that is and what that means for us to be in Christ. It's important for us as believers to understand who we are in Christ and the power that comes with that that many people are living every day without that uh, without that knowledge and without that power um, but we're going to talk a little bit about what that means in order to talk about what that means I'm first going to tell you when, when last week I talked about when I was 16 and, and my life then and what happened and, and how I was a thief and I was a liar and I was a degenerate in every sense of the word I was heading to a devil's hell and I'm pretty sure I was leading the line there before God called to me I say that to you not for everybody to give attention to me. I say that to you to understand this is who I was. And I boast in my weakness because like we talked about last week when God told Paul that my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. He went on to tell Paul that when you are weak is when I am made strong. So I tell you that and I want the power of Christ to rest upon me. So I tell you about my weaknesses so I can tell you so I can explain to you what it means when we are in Christ. I stand here today to tell you about these weaknesses, and I will boast about them. I want to tell you who you are in Christ, but in order for me to tell you who you are in Christ, we first need to understand who we are when we're outside of Christ, when we're not walking with Him, who we are uh, without Christ. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. It's in Romans 5.12, and I've read this this, uh, passage of Scripture Uh, multiple times this week alone. And I've read it not only in in the King James, but I've read it in the NIV. I've read it in the New King James. I even went back and I read it in Greek because I wanted to make sure that I got the core meaning of what this was. And this is basically what what Paul was telling us here. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, this is starting verse 12, and in this way death came to all people because all sin, to be sure. Sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who is the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one, one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if the trespass of the one man death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man Jesus Christ? Consequently, Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also the righteousness act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that trespassing might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that... Just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know that was a lot, but but, this is what Paul's telling us. Paul's telling us that just because one man, me and Adam, plunged the entire world into sin, it takes one righteous man to bring the world out of sin, that righteous man being Jesus Christ. So we start out and we have a scale. And when Adam sinned, it tilted the whole world and plunged us all into sin. It plunged us all into death. Remember, the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's the gift that Paul's talking about here. So in order for us to understand who we are in Christ, we have to understand who we're not. 
when we're no longer. Before Christ, we were sinners and we were deemed for a devil's hand. We were heading that direction. We had no power. Because of what Adam did, because Adam ate the fruit and plunged the world into sin, and then Moses came and Moses was given the law by God, but the Bible tells us that no man could follow that law. So because no one could follow that law, then Jesus came. And he fulfilled prophecy, and Jesus came, and he reigned, and he did what he had to do to grant us the opportunity to go to heaven with him. So we have to understand that who we are without Christ is dead. We're dead men. Because the Bible says that for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, or fall short of the glory of God. And it also tells us that the wages of sin is death. So if we don't have Christ, if we have sin in our lives, then we are dead. And waiting. But thank God that's not who we are anymore. The gift that they talk about is Jesus. And he brought the world out of sin and into the light. Now, just because sin has increased in our lives, grace has increased even more. We cannot live up to that law of Moses. We, we had to be justified. We had to understand that we were once depressed, sad, and hopeless, but then we were justified. You know what justified stands for? It means just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justified means. Just as if I'd never sinned. When God looks at us now, because we are in Christ, he looks at us just as if we'd never sinned. Our slate's been wiped clean, and we are new. We have begun life anew because of what Christ has done. That should get you a little bit excited knowing that we can stand before God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that we can boldly approach the throne of Christ because of what he's done for us. Because of what he has done in the sense of giving us an opportunity of understanding who we are in him. We can boldly, boldly approach the throne of Christ because he looks at us just as if we'd never sinned. That's got to get you a little bit excited. It got me excited because that's when I realized I'm no longer that degenerate that I once was. I'm no longer that thief and liar that I was once identified with. and still now identify with the cross. And the cross covers all. I'm no longer any of those things. In fact, I'm the exact opposite. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. If you got your Bible, this is important. I want you to remember the scripture. I want you to read this verse. And I, want you to, I want you to meditate on it. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things come new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible tells us that if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. He's no longer that person that he once was. When I accepted Christ and received Christ into my heart, I was no longer that degenerate that I was. I was that, that guy is dead and gone. He has been buried. And a new creation lives. And that new creation is me as a born-again Christian. And the new creation is me in the sense that God looks at me and he doesn't see me. He doesn't see my flesh no longer. Instead, he sees the blood of Christ that covers me. And I'm no longer that person that I once was. But instead, I have been born again through Christ Jesus. It tells us that he is not imputing their trespasses unto them. That means no longer is our sins being held against us. Because the sin has already been paid for, that debt is paid, and the cross covers all. Amen. Y'all got to get a little bit louder. I can't quite hear you. Y'all are louder when it's raining. <laughs> the Bible tells us that we are God's ambassadors, which means that we are to take the word of the Lord and spread it as, we, as an ambassador does in goodwill. But then he finishes that verse. He finishes that that passage of scripture, and he wraps the entire gospel up into one verse. When he says that God made him who had no sin, meaning Jesus Christ, he made him become sin. He took Kobe's sin. He took all my lies and my thievery and my deceit, and he took all that. And he nailed it to the cross. 
God made him have no sin. He made him become sin. So that through him, we can become the righteousness of God in him. That's amazing. That gets you a little bit excited to understand what God's done for us. Everything that we do was by Christ. Was, it is through Christ and it is for Christ. Everything points to the same, uh, same common thing. And that is that Jesus Christ is will reign forever excuse me no longer are we going to be defined by our struggles and our sin instead we are defined by the cross we are reconciled to christ by christ and for christ everything points to his supremacy including our salvation i understand this we are free from the captivity of sin but that does not mean that we won't sin because we will i don't believe i've ever made it a day without sinning but the cross covers that the bible tells us that in romans 6 that we're no longer bound by sin that we're free from sin to become slaves or servants to righteousness so before christ we were a sinful people bound for a devil's hell and then Christ came and he set us free and we became a new creation. The bondage was broken and we become new creatures in Christ. No longer to live a defeated and captive life. Christ reigns supreme. He is the only way that we can be made right in the eyes of, Christ, in the eyes of God and be reconciled back to him. In whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all people unto himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having been made peace through the blood of his cross. That's in Colossians 1, 14, 20. It talks about the supremacy of Christ. And it says again that word. Again, we see Paul talking about being reconciled to Jesus Christ. He tells us that it pleased God to have the fullness dwell in him and by him to reconcile all things to him. We keep seeing the common goal here. We read these two passages of scripture and begin to see God in a little bit of a different light maybe. You see, when I was a young man, especially when I first became a Christian, I viewed God as, as a judge with a gavel. And he was waiting on me to mess up. And trust me, he didn't have to wait long before I began to fall on my face. But then as I read these passages of Scripture, I don't see God that way. I see God more of a, as a loving father with his arms wide open, saying, just come home. I ain't worried about what you've done. I ain't worried about what you're doing. I just want to start from here and start over and give you new life. And as Jesus said in the Gospels, give us life more abundantly. Because anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. So I ask you to ask yourself today, who are you in Christ? You see, once we receive Christ, we're more than just a new creation and we're more than just reconciled. John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're children of a king. I get you a little excited. We're children of a king. That's quite a promotion that we've made. We're no longer degenerates. We're new creations. We're no longer wondering because we've been reconciled. And we're no longer without purpose because we're children of the Most High King. That's a far cry from the prisoner headed to a devil's hell that we started out as. And now we've moved all the way up to child of the Most High. And that gets me a little excited. I know a lot of people are wondering, well, what if I keep messing up? What if I keep failing? What if I keep faltering? Don't worry, because you will. That's all right. There's an old mercy, there's not, 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 not an old, there's a Mercy Me song that I love, and the song's called Greater. Some of you guys are familiar with it. And the bridge of that song says, There'll be days that I lose the battle. Grace says that it doesn't matter because the cross already won the war. And I love that bridge. That makes so much sense. There's so much truth in that. The war has done been won, church. 
Christ will reign supreme no matter what we do. Christ still sits on the throne. And because of the cross, we too will reign with him. The war has done been won and the cross is enough. The problem is that we sometimes as Christians, we make salvation more difficult than it actually needs to be. Sometimes we make people jump through religious hoops to say this is what it takes to be a, to be to be a follower of Christ. You have to do this, 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 and this. You have to get this in order in order to be a member of the church. You have to have this to be a Christian. But what did Jesus say when he seen his disciples? He said, "Come, follow me." He never said, "Get your own house in order before you come after me." He never said, "Make sure you don't have any sin in your life before you come to me." He just said, "Come and follow me." And they dropped everything and they followed him because they became new creations in Christ. They no longer worried about the things of their past. Instead, they worried about their future. And their future was in Christ. And they began to change. They began to be transformed. Paul tells us in, in the Romans, to be ye there transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to understand that we're not the old us. We're new people. We're new in Christ. And with that being said, I want to be clear that having Christ in your life is not a license to go on sinning. It's not that at all. In fact, it's the opposite of that. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, And they that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So it says those... That are Christ. Those that have belonged to Christ. Those that have received Christ and our Lord and Savior. The Bible says that we have crucified our flesh and the affections and the lusts. We crucified those things. They are dead and gone. And then Romans 6 tells us this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, here we go again, that our old man is crucified with him and the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin. We were trapped in sin at one time that sin had us leading to death. But then we found Christ and accepted him in our lives. Henceforth we became a new creation. We are no longer sinful. But we have died to sin, we have crucified our sins, and we are free to live in righteousness. So just because we have that safety net of Christ that says just because you sin doesn't mean you're going to hell does not give us a license to continue sinning. Instead, we are supposed to understand that those that are in Christ should strive for that perfection. When I found Christ in my life, when I accepted Jesus, I no longer wanted to do those things. I found myself desiring the fruits more of the Spirit than of the flesh. I no longer look forward to having a raging party and not remembering the time that I had. Instead, I looked forward to Sundays when I could go and worship with a body of believers. I no longer look forward to anything as much as I longed for that embracement and that feeling that I got from Christ when I arrived at church on Sunday mornings. That's, as believers in Christ, that is as new creations, that's what we should desire, is that feeling and that closeness with the Father. We shouldn't look at it as being like, well, I can still do this and I'm still saved. I can do this and I'm still saved. Because your heart's not in the right place. As believers, we have to understand who we are in Christ. And who is it that we are? We're no longer sinful, though we have sin in our lives. We're no longer bound by that sin. No more are we degenerates. The Bible says that we're new creations reconciled in Christ and children of a king. With heir, and we are heirs with Christ. And our citizenship is in heaven. 
Now the devil will come in your life and he will tell you, uh, telling you that you are not a Christian, that you sin too much, that you fail too much, you don't read the Bible enough, you don't pray enough. Has anybody ever had them thoughts in your head? The devil will get you convinced, and he will tell you that he, he that you are not who you need or who you say you are. But he is a liar, and he wants you to live as a defeated Christian. You see, once you accept Christ. You're going to heaven. Heaven is your home. But the devil will do everything he can to prevent you from living a victorious life. He'll get you angry at people. He'll begin to put bitterness in your heart. He'll begin to start thinking, well, I know I'm a Christian, and I know so so and so's a Christian. But I don't like the way they do things. I don't like the way that they talk to me, like the way that they don't talk to me. And that bitterness will begin to grow inside of you. And division will come and you will live a defeated life for no reason when you could have been free in Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you may have life and might have it more abundantly. That's what Jesus said. The devil's only got three purposes in this entire world. That is to steal, to kill, and destroy. If he can't steal your joy, he'll try to kill your joy. If he can't destroy, if he can't, if he sees you having a, a, a joyous and productive life in Christ, he will destroy it. He will do everything he can to get between you and the Father. I want you, I tell you that not to scare you, I tell you that so that you are prepared to understand that this life that we live is a battle. It's a battleground. We will fight until the day that Christ returns or until the day that we go by the grave. We will fight in this battle. And the devil will not stop. And he's got a lot of years of experience on us. <coughs> Excuse me. The other day I was at work and, and uh, I was walking up this road. I call it the road to Emmaus because it's like suffering and it's like two miles. And these guys, they walk with me and they're a lot better shape than I am. <coughs> I tell them I'm in shape. I tell them rounds of shape. But... <coughs> We walk in this, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine who, who's just, he's a young Christian, and I began to talk to him, and I began to minister to him, and he said, I just, I keep struggling, I keep sinning. I said, don't worry about that, the cross covers that. I said, what I would suggest you to do is you have to understand that surrendering to Christ has got to be made up in your mind and in your heart. That is a self-disciplined decision that you have to make that I will submit to Christ. I will bow to Christ and to Christ alone. There's no easy magic wand that we can wave that just makes you fully uh, fully Christian, no longer sinning. It doesn't happen like that. Instead, I told him it's a mindset that he, that he has to have. He has to make up in his mind, I will serve Christ. I said, I, my suggestion is whatever you're struggling on, begin to meditate, memorize verses. He said, will that help? I said, well, Jesus quoted scripture to the devil when he was tempted. Seems to work for me when I quote scripture to the devil when I'm tempted. It's important for us to read the word and know the word because when the enemy does come to steal, to kill, and destroy, we can be prepared for that battle. And we can fight back and let the devil know that our life belongs with the supremacy of Christ and we are heirs to the throne just as Christ is heir to the throne. He has given us abundant life and more abundantly than we can imagine because he has made us those new creations in Christ. We're not the old person, we're new. I had an old preacher one time and told me, he said, Christ will unlock the chains to your bondage, son. He said, but it's up to you to take those chains off. And what he means by that is Christ has come into our life and he has set us free from the bondage of sin, but many of us are still sitting in a corner with chains on us. We haven't taken those chains off and said, I'm free in Christ. I'm no longer bound by the things that once held me down. Instead, I'm new. I am something greater. I'm no longer a degenerate that is hopeless and lost. Instead, I am holy, I am righteous, and I am redeemed because of what the cross has done. It's not because of what we've done, because we can't do anything. We fail, we fail in comparison to what Christ has done in our lives. So Christ comes in when we accept him and he unlocks the chains of our bondage. 
And many of us are sitting here today, years into being a Christian, and we still have the chains on us. We haven't stripped those chains off. Paul says, tells us to strip things off and run our race. We have to take them chains off today, church, if we want to live life in Christ and be free in Christ and understand what that is. I want you to understand that we're never going to be good enough ourselves. I'm never going to be good enough. I can't make it to heaven on my own. I know that for a fact. To steal a quote from, the, from Paul, Christ came to save sinners of which I am the worst. That's how I feel. Until I became that new creation. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 tells us who we are. And I know what God says over me. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, But ye are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that ye may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into the light. Once you were not a people, but now ye are a people of God. Once ye had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy remember last week when i talked to you about what i had to do uh, before every service when i get away and i tell people i tell myself who i am uh, in christ i tell myself that i am holy that i am righteous and i am redeemed not because of who i am because of to whom i belong and to whom i find my identity i don't find my identity in this world i find my identity in the life to come i don't long for days in this life so much as i long to see my savior's face I long to be able to look him in the eye and thank him for everything that he has done for me. I store my treasures in heaven. And I don't say, I'm not trying to make him say, look, look at him. I'm nothing. I still sin and I still fall and I falter and I fail. And I do it daily. But I boast in my fact that I'm weak because in that weakness is when Christ is made strong. And Christ is what it's all about. We've been freed from this bondage of sin, and we need to start living our lives as free Christians. The chains have been unlocked when we accepted Christ, but we've got to take them chains off, church. We have to understand that we can't get down and depressed just because we mess up, because that just happens. It happens. We all sin. And Jesus knew that when they brought the lady to him who was caught in adultery. He said, he that was without sin, let him cross the first stone. Ain't nobody pick up a stone, did they, Sister Emma? Nobody did because they knew that they all had sin in their lives. <coughs> we all sin. But we have to understand that who we are is no longer those sinful people. We're no longer bound by that sin. Instead, we're free because of what Christ has done. We're free because of the price that was paid on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I know you're like as you're looking at me like I knew all this stuff. I know, but some people here don't. Some people need to understand who they are so they can stop living life as defeated Christians and start living life as free in Christ, free to understand that I'm, it's okay if I mess up. Maybe you're sitting today and you've never received Christ in your heart at all. And if you haven't received Christ in your life, and you not only do you have the chains on you, but that lock is still locked. And the key to that lock is shaped like a cross. A cross that was... That, that Christ died on 2,000 years ago. Now, he bore your sins and your struggles and, and your shame along with mine, along with everybody else in the world, and he took those and he took them to the cross where he sacrificed his life. And then three days later, he rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave, taking the keys so that we could have life, so that we could stand here today over 2,000 years later and say that I am new in Christ because of what he did for me. He reconciled me back to the Father. Without Jesus Christ, none of us had a standing gleam of hope at all to ever see heaven. I guarantee you most of us, I mean, almost all of us, if we still went by Old Testament law, would have been stoned and killed in a lot of reason where we sit today. According to Old Testament law, if you were 12, by the time you were 12 years old, if you back talked to your parents, you were dragged out of the city and you were stoned. You were killed that way. I wouldn't have made it past 12 years old. But because of the grace and the love that I have in Christ, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He did just that. And he loves you today. And he's telling you today, if you are a Christian, he's telling you to take those chains off. You don't need those chains in your life. 
and just bounding you down. They're holding you back from what God has got planned for you, and he has got a huge plan for you. It's amazing. We talked this week. I talked to a guy at work, and, and we talked about how we have plans for our life. And we seem like good plans to us, but God, God has got great plans for your life. There's a difference between having a good idea for your life and having a God idea for your life. And if we don't ever submit to him, we don't ever strip these chains off of us and begin to understand who I am in Christ, we're never going to fulfill and be free. We're never going to have that in our lives. As Dan and Robin, they're going to come up, I want you to start thinking of who you are in Christ. I want you to think, do you have Christ in your life? If you don't, then I want you to come talk to me. I don't care how long it takes. I'll sit out here with you all day long if it takes. We'll stay six feet apart and we'll talk about Jesus. And I'll explain to you who he is and why he loves you. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which means God saw you in the worst that you've ever been. Drowning in your sin. Gasping for air. Dying because of all the decisions that we've made on ourselves. And Jesus said, I still love you. I don't deserve that love. I tell you that right now, I don't deserve that love. Every day I wake up and that just gives me a sense of joy that God would love me knowing the things that I've done. The decisions that I've made. The people that I've hurt. That God would still choose to love me. It gets me a little emotional. gets me happy. I feel a joy in my life. And I want you to have the same joy in your life. So as they sing this final song, I believe it's turn your eyes upon Jesus. Do what it says. And turn your eyes upon Christ. Understand who you are in Christ. If you have them chains on you, strip them chains off. So I don't know how to do that. You make that decision that you're no longer going to be bound by what you once were bound by. Instead, you're going to be free in Christ. So as they come forward to sing this song, I pray that you listen to what the Spirit's got to say for you, what He's got to say to you. And I pray that you understand who you are in Christ. That from this day forward, it's the first day of the rest of your life to decide are we going to live in freedom or are we going to sit in the corner and we're going to cuddle up with our chains of bondage and sin and we're going to sit there and we're going to live defeated lives. So today, is they're going to come up, I'm going to get out of the way so we can maintain our, our distance rule. I don't know if I can walk through whether this thing's screaming at me or not. But I just, I, I, I hope that you will listen to what the Spirit has got for you today. If it's to strip those chains off and do it. If it's to come talk to me, come talk and I'll pray with you. I'll pray with you all day long. Doesn't matter to me. I want you, I don't want you to leave here today without knowing for sure. And when this life ends, you know where you're going. And I don't want you to live this life as a Christian. What is that? That's my son, sorry. I don't want you to live your life as a Christian that is, is bound and defeated. I want you to be free. I want you to be free in Christ. And if you're not free in Christ, come talk to me too. I'll talk to you about that as well. So as they sing, I pray that you do what the Spirit is leading you to do. Okay.